So this next topic, so some of the themes that we've been talking about or you might hear kind of emerging from the conversations we're, happen, we're having up here is that uh, we're talking a lot about the things around the beer as much as we are talking about the beer itself. You know, we're talking about how we sell it, the formats, the prices, the occasions, like the, the business models behind some of them. And at this point in time in kind of the history of sour beer in the U.S., which is very short and we've learned a lot very quickly about some of those things. We wanted to kind of go all in on a panel of folks that have some experience on the retail side of sour and wild ales. So that's gonna be the kind of the specific focus of the panel that we have up here. I'm really excited about some of the experts that we have that are coming at this from a few different angles. On my left here is a brewer from Creature Comforts. We have Blake Tires. Hello. And uh, I don't know the name of the restaurant group, but Church Key Sovereign Blue Jacket among 16 others uh, out of DC and thereabouts. We've got Greg Emberg. And then we've got Veronica Danko from Independent and the Jug and Bottle, right Woo! down here in Florida. Woo! Some hometown love. And then we've got Christian Gregory from Shelton Brothers. <laughs> I mean, that's an importer getting shout outs from the crowd. That's pretty exciting. <laughs> that's craft beer in 2018 right there. So I wanted to jump in from the local angle, the local angle right away, if you don't mind going first here, because uh, we've already had a we've already had one panel that was kind of a conversation around the state of sour and wild ales here in the state of Florida, uh, and then we've been talking about a lot of the things that happen around sour and wild ale and, and the way that we sell it, uh, and you've gone so far as to open up retail locations in places that in neighborhoods, uh, in, you know, in, in Tampa that weren't necessarily geared for this kind of thing. They don't necessarily have those customers right away. You kind of had to start from scratch in a way that a lot of these brewers have started to scratch. And I saw, and I saw you quoted in an article basically saying that uh, um, brewers themselves didn't have a place to sell these beers to in terms of another business, whether it was a bar or a retail location. Help me take, take us back in time a little bit and help me understand maybe some of the, the angst or, or the opportunity that you saw in the scene to bring a retail environment for these kind of beers to St. Pete and Tampa. Well, I, is this on? <laughs> um, I started back in 2005, and that was downtown St. Petersburg. Um, I mean, that's 13 years ago. <laughs> right. And I think we were, in St. Pete at least, we were the only game in town. There were a couple other beer bars in the Tampa Bay area. And then they were just a couple of breweries. Um, so there was, the market was ready, or at least there was a lot of um, opportunity for that. Um, and it was successful. Uh, we had a lot of, with sour beers, we started with, you know, the old, uh, the Belgian standbys, which I still support, like Duchess and um, Rodenbach and uh, Cantillon back then. We, we could get it and nobody bought it back then. But so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so we just started with that. And it was, you know, people just started trying it. And after a while, we sold more and more, you know, the kegs faster and, and then uh, the, the market opened up in Florida, and we've got a lot of brewers now making sour beer, and we're selling a lot of it. And some of the neighborhoods that you're in now have actually grown up around you as well in terms of just food and beverage in general. How has that, con how has that kind of contributed to the kind of customer that you're able to access now and who might be looking for these kind of beers? Well, in the Seminole Heights uh, neighborhood of Tampa, and I've been there now nine years, um, I had a lot of craft brew well, friends and they were home brewers and they were also um, they worked for you know in the beer sales and they, they said hey put the bar over here there's a lot of customers waiting to you know we need that uh, and then after a few years and, and it did work I mean it was a neighborhood full of people with nowhere to go for this kind of product and then when we opened the bottle shop three years ago literally people had to drive you know eight or ten miles in traffic every day just to go get something special uh, the local grocery store didn't have anything either so um, we opened the little shop it's tiny um, it's cute and uh, it's it's busy and it's fun and we have a lot of fun selling the beers out of there. Christian, I know a big part of what usually creates these markets, in addition to the people who are really trying hard to kind of start up the first or second or third uh, wild or sour kind of brewery in those areas, is access to other beers from around the world like that that kind of create a seed either for the drinker in that area or other brewers who you know they need to be able to taste those things in order to make things like it. They need that access to inspiration. Um, what has it been like being an importer like Shelton Brothers for a scene like Tampa and St. Pete? Like, what do you, how do you, you know, how do you guys see it through your lens? 
Because some of the beers that Veronica's talking about are beers that they would get from Shelton. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's changed a lot, first of all. Um, and I don't know specifically about Tampa and St. Pete. Um, we have the three-tier system here, so we're set apart. Well, Florida, we're in kind of a gray area. I won't go into that so much, but um, we don't have a whole lot of contact directly with each individual market from the main office. But what we've seen pretty much everywhere is, uh, well, let's see, when I started, it was 2009, and we still had Cantillon on our normal retail list where anybody that saw it could just place an order. Um, but it, it was picking up then, but we had the great Fufun crisis of 2010 when they said they weren't going to make it anymore. People went nuts because they couldn't get it. Um, and then we saw this kind of turn overnight. Um, I feel like a lot of it was sparked then, but then we've, you know, with the brewery explosion here too, and people looking at ways to make, um, you know, a sour beer quickly, they were latching onto this Berliner Weiss thing. So there was some exposure from that side too. So you're trying um, to sell Cantillon in a young market, and they're making Berliners, and those are probably getting to the same customer in some time, in some cases. Yeah, but um, I guess what I was also trying to say, and not very clearly, was that we're having um, exposure on two sides, basically. with um, We have these people looking at these classic Belgian lambics, or uh, I don't know, just mixed fermentation beers in general, like Vin- uh, Russian River was doing years ago. Um, and some people latching onto that and using that for inspiration, but then we have other people kind of in parallel who are doing the quick turn Berliner Weiss or Gosa inspired beer. Um, so it's, they've come up in different ways. Um, I think the US market really latched onto the, the kettle sours because they were easy because they kept the lot, you know, your brewery was clean in the end. Um, and there have been a lot more people to do that and not do it so well. Um, and we, I don't know, Florida was famous for Florida Vice, uh, or still is maybe. I got this far without that word being uttered. I was really uh, sorry. excited about it. Sorry. I, no, I just... Uh, I was asking somebody today what Reset that was clock. exactly, because I, I still don't really know. But, um, you know, that, so they're, they're pulling inspiration from different places. But um, it's been really interesting to see this growth uh, from people like... Well, I'll just say Jester King and not go on, because, you know, there are probably two dozen breweries doing really fantastic mixed culture beers these days, or spontaneous beers. Um, so that's, and you know, in a lot of cases doing it better than, and I shouldn't say that either, but <laughs> better than the original folks. So it's, it's, it's been really interesting to see over the past few years, probably three or four years in particular, um, that's, you know, yeah, it's taken off. Uh, Greg, I know that in the DC market, you are basically one of the major channels for these kinds of beers getting to both drinkers and brewers who are also drinkers. Um, what role do you think you know, these beers coming to market, you know, either, you know, whether they're from a couple states away or a continent away, what role do they play in, in the local beer scene coming up and making these kinds of things? It seems like that retail experience is that we all access those beers through that retail experience. How important is that to the scene in D.C. kind of building up around it? Um, I, I mean, it's, it's clearly important, and I don't want to downplay that at all, but I do think kind of echoing what Christian was saying, I think... Um, a lot of times these days, um, brewers, not just in DC, but in a lot of local markets are, are maybe not paying as much attention to the beers that are coming to the market as they should be. And, um, you know, while there's a preponderance of, of sours or wild ales available in DC, um, I'm not necessarily sure that as many of the local brewers are paying close attention to them. Um, I think that in some ways the, this, the, this segment has taken off to a point where people are making them slightly willy-nilly. Um, and, I mean, that's why it's flooded the market, frankly. And it, it's, it's, it's making it really hard. I think it's really difficult on the consumer uh, to walk into, um, you know, a retail shop or a, a beer bar and just see a wall of Sour Ale 750s um, that are just kind of piling up. Some amazing, others maybe not as much so. Um, but I, I think that there, there's a number of factors to that. But I think that one of the things we're seeing is I, I don't think enough brewers are actually as in touch with what's going on in, in, among some of the better producers, yeah. um, honestly. Like I know at Creature, you do, you do make kettle sour. You have Athena is your 
Berliner, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, and then you have obviously the, the beautiful things that we're drinking right now, which are wood aged, slow sours. How do you, inside of Creature Comforts, you and the team, how do you talk about them internally to differentiate them when they ultimately get to retail? Uh, well, generally, I think, well, first off, I'm, I always try to be stickler about that. Like, kettle sour is not a style. Uh, acidification in a kettle is a technique. And it, it can be used in many different ways, and it can add an acid component that doesn't necessarily be, need to be the main star of the show. And it also gives you an outlet to be able to make a lot of a beer uh, available uh, at a good price point. So, you know, our, our Athena Berliner Weiss is um, roughly $10 a six-pack. Whereas these bottles take us, you know, they'll sit in a barrel for a year or longer. Uh, we have minimum of three to four months of conditioning in the bottle before we release it. So obviously much slower, much longer process. Um, and for that, we'll charge more for it. And it's a conversation for us of like, yeah, this beer has acid in it. And let's talk about acid as a profile and flavor in beer, not as a defining characteristic of what makes it a style or how we made it. But this acid is here, and then it can be more complex or have different flavor profiles, depending on how you look at it, um, and be complemented with a lot of other flavors that it enhances. And if you look at this acid, not the ultimate end goal, but what's going to enhance something, then ultimately that is how we kind of wrap our conversation around it to get to the consumer, because educating them ultimately is the most important thing possible. It's like, okay, let's figure out how we can get the consumer to be able to tell the difference between this and an Athena, and why there's a price difference, and how acid either offers something to, to emphasize a flavor that we're trying to project, or how it's going to just be um, a, a refreshing light drink. Like Athena in Georgia, it's 100 degrees outside and 90% humidity. Let's, let's do a six pack and, and make it so you can take it to the pool and drink the hell out of it. Like that's the purpose of that beer, right? Or is this like, let's pour it into stemware and talk about how it emphasizes the citrus notes and adds to the depth uh, and complements the earthiness, which is kind of a yin and yang situation. So that's how we kind of do that generally. How does all that filter down to the bottle shop for you, Veronica? Well, we definitely don't have a lot of space to take everything. Um, we try to support the companies that support their employees. You know, we're, we, are, we feel like we're like that. We have a lot of long-term people with us. Every time I open a business, I take somebody with me, and we kind of—that's kind of what we our goal. Um, we do know that certain things sell that we would never think. We sold three cases of raspberry goza <laughs> the other day, and I really didn't know who was the customer going to be, but you know, we we did sell that. So we just tried to do our best to, you know, have something for everyone, and you know, support the you know the quality. Too. Yeah, I mean, it becomes a bit of a game of telephone, right? I mean. To hear you talk about these beers in such a nuanced separation between them makes sense. You know, as a producer of them, you very much are thinking about the entire back, kind of behind the scenes history of how they're made and what they're for and how you think about them. By the time it gets to retail, you have a customer that's walking in and saying, well, this is a sour and this is a sour. And I, I guess I'm curious, like, if you do have a 10 pack, if you do have a $10 six pack uh, of something that is kettle soured or Berliner, and then you have something that is, you know, $20 for a 750. How does that impact you as a retailer when you're putting those on a menu? Do you have to find a different way to describe them? Do you find a different way to serve them? Like, how, how do you go about creating differentiation for your ultimate end consumer there? Because ultimately, you're asking them pay, to pay a very different price per ounce and have a very different expectation, I would think. Uh, Greg, let's start with you. Like, what, did, what are some of the things that you do to kind of create yeah. a separation there? Well, I, if I could actually just tell a quick little... Um uh, a quick little anecdote or connection here to that point, which I'm seeing more and more today. Uh, when I got started in beer about uh, almost 15 years ago now, um, it was uh, at a place called the Bricks Keller in D.C. And at that time, uh, it's a classic story that we've talked about all the time, Christian and I, we could not give Cantillon away. So 750 milliliter bottles of Cantillon were just piling up in the back, this is you know, 2003, 2004. Um, but what people loved to drink was Lindemann's Framboise or Lindemann's Creek. And they would happily pay $15 for 375 of 3.8% diluted sweetened um, sour beer, fruited sour. And uh, you know, I think most of us here set out to protest that and have done that with our drinking habits and what we've purveyed over time. But 
to your point and your question, today, um, people love to drink sweet, fruited sours. And it's come back around to the same kind of, I don't even know if I say mainstream, but like people come in and they are willing to pay for less dry, less funk, smaller package format. Um, you know, the raspberry goes as you saw three cases of. And, and so I don't even know how you, you, you break that down, but for sure there is this, 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 this desire and palate has not gone away. Um, and it's, it's kind of shocking to see how hard it can be to sell some of these great, especially 750 milliliter bottles of nearly anything, but also these beers, uh, when people really just want uh, something else. When it comes to kind of like the, the supply chain for these kinds of beers, Christian, I want to ask you, because uh, one of the things that Shelton does is it looks for people who are making the kind of beers that they're kind of looking into the future a little bit, sometimes short term, sometimes very long term, uh, and trying to build brands over time. And Cantillon is, you know, an obviously great historical example of how you found a small producer, stuck to it over time, built it up, and now it's, and then it kind of had its moment eventually. What are you looking for in small brewers now? Because now you're picking up small U.S. brewers as well, Green Bench being one of them. What are you looking for in a small brewer making these kinds of beers now that makes you feel like they might be successful in sort of the, you know, the medium long term kind of aspect? Uh, actually, we're, we're not really looking for new breweries right now. We're kind of, <laughs> there's so many, um, it, and a lot of people doing really great things. And at this point, I mean, we're tra- kind of like, reinventing ourselves almost or trying to uh, oh, so. just uh, still working on it but <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean po- point, point is mostly like um, you know at a certain time a few years back it was you know we were looking for small guys who were not really that interested in you know frankly the commercial side of it they were looking at just making the best beer they could and making like nuanced characterful balanced beer I, I guess balance has always been the thing we look for um, whether it's in sour beer or and I hate saying sour beer in general, but, you know, whatever. Um, or in Pilsner. Uh, and that's, I mean, certainly we have, you know, a, sometimes a fridge full of samples from U.S. brewers who are making the most sour, the most hoppy, or the most whatever. And that's just not what, I don't know, that's not what I want to pick up and drink again and again. And but that's what Greg I, is saying is going to sell. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it sells for sure. <laughs> but I, I don't know, I guess we're trying to... Uh, our, our whole idea has been like, you know, the beer geek scene has changed in the U.S. over the past few years, but we've always thought like a balanced beer that has a lot of character and nuance. Also, you know, it'll appeal to the beer geek, but at the same time, it's going to appeal to quote unquote normal people. Um, and, I, you know, we were sort of heading this direction of the discussion earlier, but like wine drinkers, for example, they're a huge part of the market for sour beer, I think. Like we've talked to so many different bar and retail folks that say that's kind of like a transition beer for them. And that's kind of what we always thought about Cantillon from the start was, uh, you know, it, it does something for everybody. It's got the acidity. It's got the, I don't know, there, there's a lot going on there. And I think that appeals to a lot of people who would normally not even think about ordering a beer at the bar. Uh, of course, Cantillon is not something that anybody's ordering at the bar these days. But, um, Unless you're you know, in D.C., and you're uh, in sovereign. <laughs> Greg, Greg, yeah, Greg might have some. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, basically that's it. We're just we're looking for people making characterful beer. Yeah. From like a certain. That's a tough sell, though, right? From a language standpoint, nobody walks into a bar, you know, look, scanning the menu for the word balance. Give me a thoughtful beer. Oh no, that's the thing. <laughs> or yeah, thoughtful, yeah. Uh, or small <laughs> even. They're they're looking for something that's going to jump off that list and say, "Buy me." Uh, I guess I'm curious. When it comes to these sour, wild, funky beers, Veronica, what are some of the words? I mean, why do you think the person bought a, was it the, I can't remember the, the fruit now. That was at the store, but I was told that yesterday. Yeah. I didn't get it at the bar, because I, I was like, who's going to drink this? Because it goes, uh, you know, salty. But, but um, what, do you th- what do you think was, uh, were they looking for that, or was there something about that that jumps for them? Like, what, do you ima- like, what are the words that people are looking for that are moving these beers? Well, like what he said, it's, it's just somebody specifically was looking for something you know, fruity and, and light and, and, yeah. and tangy or uh, tart. Um, I think something should be said about the employees that you have, the staff. Like, what we do is we, whatever we put on, you know, we're selling it. So we're choosing it for the customer. So especially in the bar, I only have 14 taps over there. We always have two 
sour beers on. They're different. There's usually a Goza Berliner and something else. It could okay. be a wild ale. It could be a local wild ale. It could be something Belgian. Um, but we're leading people to drink these things, and, and they're putting their trust in us that we're choosing correctly. And if you're running a good business, they're trusting you. Like mm-hmm. They don't have to doubt your, you know, your draft list. So we're doing it that way. What about you, Greg? What are the... What do you think the words are that people have on their minds right now when they come into a place like yours that are, they're looking for and finding? Uh, well, those words are hoppy, um, <laughs> pastry. You know, I mean, you know, it's. I I think as far as this as far as the sour um, beer discussion goes, um, I think that they're looking for. Uh, it's it's a lot of different people. I mean, there definitely are people out there looking for. Uh, mixed fermentation beers, uh, lambic, saisons of all ilks, and fruited sours. But you know, we've we've always indicated to the guests um, categorically, and we've paid less attention on our menus to spe- you know specific styles. And I think that that has been helpful in being able to turn people on to new things. So if you're going to group sour beers, or as we call them, tart and funky beers, into three major categories. And you go like delicate versus earthy and dry versus fruity and vinous. Um, that allows you to sneak some beers in on people. So, you know, in the delicate category, you may have a very simple uh, Berliner Weisse um, seasoned with uh, any manner of fruit. But we can also get in a very beautiful, subtly nuanced um, mixed ferment table beer in the same place. So I think we've actually chosen to go more, you know, broad and stayed away from styles in an effort to curate and teach um, rather than to be as prescriptive. It almost sounds like you're trying to evoke a feeling or the mood that somebody's in more than a style. And, f- and food, too. I mean, I, it's frankly a little depressing how little food and beer um, pairings are talked about today versus how they maybe were like 10 years ago. But talking categorically about flavor and dealing with moods and, and expressiveness of character allows us to then talk about food and beer interactions in a way that I think happens less when it's just about um, a can of a fruited um, sour. When you talk about it that way and you're talking about the experience that the drinker's looking for, either like the kind of food and beverage experience they want or the mood or whatever it is, like that starts to sound like the way I've heard you talk about it as a producer as well. Like That circle starts to complete a little bit for me. Because um, sure. you're a wine drinker also, and I know that you... Yeah. I've heard you take a lot of that kind of language that you've heard from wine producers and chefs who talk about wine, and you started talking about your beers that way. Well, it's it's an established market, right? So it's it's cheating in a way where like relatively we're the we're the adolescent in this crew, right? In the, the world of talking about flavor and whatever we're doing. So if that's the case, you know, I look to winemakers because they've been dealing with wood and mixed fermentation for a lot longer at least from a mass production point of view than we have, particularly in America, with these kinds of beers. Uh, so I, I try to you know, look at how they dissect flavor because it gives me a new lens to a way to look at what I make and reflect upon how I can improve it because they're talking about things that don't include the word hops or you know, yeast or whatever. They're, you know, they're talking about flavor structure. And that's where it's like, you know, I can learn from a producer from anyone that's making any sort of flavor, whether it be a cocktail maker, a chef, uh, a you know, wine maker, or a beer maker, if you are talking about how to put flavor together, then I can learn about how you're thinking, and that helps me be a better producer, particularly when you're blending. Um, and then I think all this like really echoes the food world in a lot of ways, or any other n- number of things, where it's like we have the fast food world, where it's, or you have certain foods that are super heavy in sugar, super heavy in fat, super heavy in salt, and that is what everyone wants. Uh, from a large, you know, eco- like economy point of view, but then you get nuanced places where, it's like, you go to have tasting menus. They're going to give you challenging dishes that may be smoked or have acid or have kind of really funky fermented flavors, and that's going to be a nuanced person that's willing to pay for that. That is going to dive into that thing. So I, I don't like this. Really, isn't a huge surprise that the market's going to be shaking out this way. I think the better way is to figure out how to have that avenue to meet your consumer because right now it's. It's hard to do these things and find where it all fits, right? Because it's all so new. Whereas, um, you know, people are used to growing up and understanding, like, well, if I go to this chain local 
whatever restaurant are not local, but this chain restaurant, and I get a burger, it's going to be X. Um, if I go to this other place and I say, like, give me your tasting menu, uh, I'm going to have a person who's going to present these flavors to me and help me walk through this, and I'm willing to pay for that experience. Um, and not every consumer wants both, uh, or either or, you know, and uh, some people, you know, just want to have sodas, and some people want to have, uh, you know, whatever complex Negroni or whatever, you know, like it's, you go back and forth between like these polarizing flavors and it kind of explains how I think people approach drinking beer or make those purchasing decisions because they're looking for either familiar flavors or easy flavors versus people who want to be challenged and, and taste things. Now, you don't get to control who walks into your bars or bottle shops or your restaurants. When you confront somebody who maybe wasn't prepared for those kind of expectations, it wasn't ready to go on a journey, but uh, how, how, how do you line up somebody to invest more time and thought into the experience of walking into your place than maybe they thought they were going to when they first crossed that threshold? Like, is there, are there things that you do or things that you train your staff to do to get them on board really quickly and, and engaged, or, uh, or do you just have to service that person in a completely different way? Um, yeah, so the first thing that we do as a restaurant group, and this goes beyond beverage or beer, um, is to say yes, to say yes, every time. So that, that, that's what our, our message always is, is to figure out a way to say yes, to make the guest love your place and the experience they have at your place. And so with that in mind, if you know, people come in and they want to go on that journey or they're not even sure and you want to lead them there, I mean, it starts with splashing them with every beer you can think of off your draft system. It continues with... Um, purveying four ounce pours. We do that with every single draft beer we have instead of making people commit to full pours. Um, and engaging and spending time staffing appropriately so you can actually spend time with the guests rather than just like sling drinks. Um, those are just some of the, the ways I think we go about doing it. I mean, that last one is a really subtle one, but it has a huge difference. If somebody's just like, what can I get you? And they want you to have an answer right away. Right that's not a moment when you're going to bring anybody anywhere. No, like they're just going to exactly. say IPA every time. You know, and at the end of the day, we're not, you know, you can go to a number of places to get uh, a beer or to grab a cocktail or get a wine. And, and I do that all the time. We all do that all the time. Grab a bite to eat. But we want people to come back to our restaurants for an experience, a memorable one. It doesn't have to be pedantic. It doesn't have to be a lecture about the state of sour beer in 2018. But... It should be something that's memorable and something that is, is also suited to the guest. I mean, in hospitality, knowing what the guest is interested in and giving that to he or she is, frankly, the hardest part. Um, but tailoring the experience is, um, is, is really um, tantamount to, to what we're up to all the time. Yeah, you got to do it on the fly. Veronica, the neighborhood that you opened your places in have changed. And I would imagine that with that, the clientele is changing and you're kind of always adjusting to the new normal. Uh, what are some of the major things that you've had to adjust in the shop from a retail perspective uh, to meet the demands of this new kind of audience that's always evolving for you? Like, how have prices changed for you over time? And, and how have the, the maybe the breadth of styles or the formats for you changed over time? I think uh, I noted down here that at some point, you had 15 taps and 400 bottles at the Independent. Uh, I hope you don't have 400 bottles anymore. <laughs> really trying to pare that down, believe me. You know, there's, yeah, there's so many beers. It's, it's great and it's terrible at the same time. Um, you know, every time somebody comes in and says, I'm, this beer's now in town, I'm like, oh, go away. You know, but um, I don't really mean it. Um, well, the prices of the beers um, that have been around for the last 13 years haven't changed that much. They've gone up a little bit over time, but not as much as you would think. Um, we try to keep our price points affordable. We want people to be able to come in and have three or four delicious beers, you know, rather than one, you know, to break the break the bank. Um, we have a lot of uh, James Beer nominated restaurants down the street. Um, these are my friends. They all also have amazing beer lists in their restaurants. Um, the whole neighborhood is oh, several breweries. They're all. So it's really a, a tourist destination now, um, and I think we're all kind of in it together, and we refer around. Um, and so just personally, we just like to try to stay on our game and, and customer service and selection and cleanliness and all those things. Do you find yourself getting much more, I guess, sort of casual or mainstream consumers coming into your shop now that are shopping for beer, whereas before it was maybe more of a, a destination and a drive? Definitely, um, because our neighborhood is now getting an influx of, of, of a new type of 
resident. <laughs> so, um, which is great, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. So yeah, we are seeing new faces and, uh, you know, maybe their expectations would be more on a Cheney side of the, you know, or a more luxurious uh, type of establishment. And I think they are embracing our vibe over there. And do you find that you're, are you engaging them through the person to person or do you, do you do things in the retail environment that help educate passively? You know, do you have shelf talkers that talk about styles in any way or do you have, you know, are there things on the, you know, at the counter that help people navigate somehow or do you try and do it on a person to person basis? We're so grassroots. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I mean, my guys just, they're, they're the face of the place, guys yeah. and girls, by the way. Um, they're just, they're amazing and they're the ones that keep the customers coming back and they, they aren't pretentious about it. They are very, um, you know, like school teachers, like kindergarten <laughs> teachers, leading people to what they want. Uh, so yeah, that's what we do. Uh, like I wanted to finish with you because I, I, there's the new development in the laws in Georgia um, are a big part of what I think even makes you relevant to this panel because up until now you were not retailers at all. Nope. Uh, what has it been like being a producer that suddenly, you know, you've always had a tap room and you've done tours and things like that, so there's always been a little bit of that kind of environment, but not a place that people came to drink and shop in the same way. No. How have those laws changed the way in which you guys think about the beers you're putting into the market? Because now you have a direct over your own bar conversation with your customers, whereas before it went out into a wholesale system. Yeah, I've had a, I've been through a serious point of reflection and, and learning curve um, and listening to people like these guys talking about how they do it because it's a totally new game for it's us. It's not all your salespeople's fault anymore, is it? No. <laughs> uh, so come on. No. Um, so now what's great is that we can offer a different experience for people who walk in. Um, before, for those of you who don't know about Georgia, until September of last year, if you came into a brewery tasting room, you couldn't buy beer. We were not allowed to sell beer. What we could sell you is a... Uh, Two years ago, up to two years ago, we could sell you a glass, and we were allowed to pour free beer into that glass. Um, we were a glass company that had beer to give away. Um, and then for about a year or a year and a half or so, it got a little clearer where we could sell an actual tour, and part of that tour package could be scaled in a way, um, and that made us get creative. So on a normal day, you would be able to come in and say, I want to buy um, a tour, and we'd give you uh, a Willie Becker glass, you come in, you have 36 ounces of samples you could go through and, and taste. Um, but then what we would do is we'd like have small bottle releases, we would sell a tour that would be uh, an event. And so you'd come in and that tour would be a small tour with limited amount of people. So we would have 200 people, a jazz band, way overstaffed, uh, food pairings, um, special bottles, and you get to go home with some, and that's all part of the tour package. But that also made us devalue the beer because we couldn't say all the value of the tour was directly related to the alcohol. Uh, so that got complicated for a while. But now we can have a totally different experience. Um, and it's motivated us to really focus on how people can come into our tasting room and change that experience. So now we're on average before we might have had like six beers on draft. Uh, we've had a solid 15 or so. Um, and it just really focuses on that. We also have now a whole vintage bottle program. Uh, you can taste beers that we've made for the last three or four years, uh, and then we've got about another 10 to 15 bottles that are available. We have certain bottles for sale, um, like our Subtle Alchemy series, you can only drink in our tasting room, and we haven't sold that to go. It's only an on-premise beer where we'll pour it for you, talk to you about it, try to explain that. And that whole thing, it's trying to create a new sort of experience for someone who wants to come in. So if you want to come in and just drink Pilsner or IPA or whatever, that's great. Um, we have that option for you. And if you want to come in and, and, and kind of go through some different experiences and, and you know, taste what is in that world, we can, we can do that as well. well what, the lesson I take away from that kind of transition, though, is that you know as a producer that you don't always have retail locations like Veronica and Greg's where you can trust a, like, a very complicated story or a product or a profile or something. I know you just made a still beer. You're thinking about making still beers. Yeah. Um, those are, you can't just throw those into a, a distribution system and hope they get to the right customer with the right person handing those over. You no. have to have some trust there, and there's not a lot of those places to go around. Being able to do it in your own retail location gives you at least one, one outlet you really trust where you can try some of these things. Yeah, it's a huge double-edged sword, right? So now we can have this direct consumer uh, interaction, but also it's like, hey, I'm totally new. Uh, by the way, I'm dropping all these bottles, and you guys are going to buy them all. And it's like, no, we're not. Uh, <laughs> So then you figure out, like, okay, well, how do I need to reinvent the way I make beer or, um, you know, run a, a program where it's putting out these sorts of beers? Because, um, you know, like, no one's giving, 
going to give you a pat on the back for making a big blend. Like, no one cares like that you made a lot of a beer, you know, uh, which is hard. It's hard to make a large volume of high quality beer, but nobody cares. Like, what they care about is like, uh, you know, let's try to make this more relevant. So let's take this, make more variations on it, uh, add more ingredients or do different blends do smaller packaging runs, make it more frequent, so then it becomes another piece. Of, it's like you have to figure out how to grow that business completely independently. And that's how you end up with so many SKUs. Yeah. <laughs> but then it's also, you Here wanna, we are. You want to listen to these guys, because it's like, man, uh, I'm not used to thinking, I'm, I'm selfish, right? Like, I'm not used to thinking about um, how to take care of your consumer that way. Uh, I'm used to thinking about how I want to make beer. And so that's been a big learning thing I had to go through and I like listening to people you know Greg's talking about like here's how we do service I'm like yeah okay let me take some notes like because uh, our staff is new to that as well and our everything about it is like okay how can we start changing this whole environment and we have to do it slowly because the Georgia market also isn't used to being able to you know there's several people who still want to just buy a glass or buy a tour and go in and just drink some beer even though we've priced several beers specifically to equate to the same amount, people think that we now cost a lot more money. Uh, it, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it, you, know, you want to figure out how, at the end of the day, your ultimate goal, and I've picked that up from the restaurant world, and is, is to provide an experience for your consumer and to give them a good place and make them feel good. And it has to make sense to them in the end. It has, it has to, be to make they, sense. They have to understand the price, <laughs> the format, the experience. You can't make people buy your beer. Uh, there you have it. Yeah. Blake, Greg, Veronica, Christian, thank you very much for joining me and talking about uh, the retail of Sour and Wild Ales. I appreciate your insight. Thank you. Thank you.